Hi, I'm Susan Lloyd. Hi, I'm Keith Ghostland, and welcome to All Things LGBTQ. We are taping on Tuesday, May 14th. All Things LGBTQ is taped at Orca Media in Montpelier, Vermont, which we recognize as being unceded indigenous land. And we hope Anne and Linda are having a wonderful time at P-Town celebrating Anne's birthday. So happy birthday. Happy birthday. And, and with that. <clears throat> well, in honor of your birthday, Anne, <laughs> it's a bit of an insurrection. I hope you'll understand. Uh, I thought I would, uh, you know, mix things up a bit and uh, have some news that was fun. You remember fun, don't you guys? <laughs> It's the happy so, news. It's the happy news. That's right. So I'm going to start with some international news. And I need to say, I'm partly teasing, but really not. And I had to cull through hundreds of articles to find the good. So we've been teasing you for years. Exactly. <laughs> but actually, now you know why. Uh, now I know why. Exactly. But here's some good news. Uh, Tel Aviv. So uh, they announced the cancellation of their annual Pride Parade, which doesn't sound fun. But they, you know, the, the thought behind it was to keep everybody safe, given what's going mm -hmm. on there. And instead, they're going to hold a rally as a sign of pride, hope, and freedom. They really wanted to honor the 132 people uh, that are still kidnapped in Gaza. And uh, so they didn't, they didn't want to dishonor them by celebrating with a parade, but they are going to hold a rally uh, to help people process that. This parade has been a celebration for many, many generations of love and equal rights, and now, even in these difficult days, they want to continue to fight uh, for a free and tolerant future, even if they have to cancel the parade itself. So. And then I thought this was fun. <clears throat> Swiss singer Nemo. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Won the Eurovision Song Contest. Yes. Have I you ever saw. seen this? I lived in I, Europe for several years, and that stuff is off the hook. Those contests are wild. Uh, they had an operatic pop rap song called The Code about their own personal journey to accepting their non-binary identity. Uh, they said, I went to hell and back to find myself and broke the code in the chorus of their winning song. Dressed, because I know you want to know these things, Keith. They were dressed in a frilly pink blouse and miniskirt. I Nemo saw Nemo da dazzled the audience at the Malmo Arena in Sweden, home to last year's winner, Laureen. Over to Poland, declaring that she would go to hell to make a deal with the devil to advance the rights of Poland's LGBTQ community Equalities Minister Katarina Kachula joined the Equality March in Lodz, the country's fourth largest city, on May 11th. The march was the 13th edition of the event and the first time it's been attended by a government minister. Last year, Poland elected a new government coalition of center-left leaning parties that have pledged to support LGBTQ rights, which of course is a sharp contrast for everything that Anne has said over the last <laughs> 10 years. <laughs> the right-wing hostile government that preceded them. They've been slow to act on their promises, uh, including a law on civil unions, a uh, ban on hate speech, and a Gender Recognition Act, amid squabbling from more conservative members. In South Korea, there's a bit of a theme here as we're entering Pride season, right? The queer culture festival that has been held at the Seoul Plaza at City Hall since 2015 uh, was denied a permit for a second year in a row. Ooh. Last year, so they have a conservative-leaning city council. They decided to give it to a Christian youth concert last year, and this year they're giving it to, this is so lame, an outdoor library that works over the summer, <laughs> effectively blocking their Anybody ability to get a permit. Youth. So the response was obviously they're focusing on events that suit their own personal taste. So they decided... To, to move several blocks away in downtown Seoul and to an area that only requires a city permit from the police and they don't have to go through all the paperwork. So the festival takes place over two weeks in June, kicks off with a parade on June 1st, 
a queer film festival, live performances, 60 booths for vendors and interactive events. The librarians are going to be, <laughs> the are gonna be sorry they kicked them out. Exactly. Yeah. OK, so now. <clears throat> Vampires is our next topic of discussion. I know. I told you it's going to be fun. Okay. Uh, we recently learned that two of the hottest actors in the world, I mean, I wouldn't say this, but Kristen Stewart and Oscar Isaac are teaming up for a hedonistic vampire movie entitled Flesh of the Gods. They play a married couple who live in a skyscraper in the 80s and they kind of troll L.A. at night. They cross paths with a mysterious nameless, hard-partying cobble, and they're seduced into a glamorous, surrealistic world of hedonism, thrills, and violence. And they've both had, they're brutal, sexy, and queer. And they've had multiple relationships with same-sex partners. Which let, let, <laughs> let, no, Linda, Linda will want to know where can she go okay, watch I this. Okay, I know, I know. I meant to do that. I'll have to send that later. But along those lines, this person who was writing this article, these are their three favorite movies with queer vampires. See, I, had, I went down that rabbit hole. You know, once you click on something, it's, it's over, people. Mm -hmm. uh, Carmilla is a web series and a movie based on the 1872 gothic novella of the same name. Features a young woman being preyed upon by a female vampire. It's the original lesbian vampire. And as I say to Linda and Anne, make the popcorn, Keith. We'll be over. What We Do in the Shadows is yeah. the second one. Have you heard of this? Yeah. It's an FX series, follows a group of immortal and queer vampires. It's delightfully gay with every one of the vampires having been with same-sex partners on screen. And then the rebooting interview with the vampire. I, I was waiting for that one. Uh, which, you know, all that homoerotic subtext of the original book out, well, acted out loud in front of our eyes. My favorite, <clears throat> however, was The Hunger. Mm. With Susan Sarandon, David Bowie, uh, Catherine Deneuve. And that was back before it yeah. was cool to do those kinds of things, right? Exactly. Uh, and then also, so I, I, I found a lot of film and TV things. Hacks. Have you heard of Hacks? I, this is yes. another thing I need to work. It's It's a Max uh, comedy starring Jean Smart. Wasn't she on Designing Women? She absolutely was. Uh, and Hannah Einbinder is back for a third season and hotter than ever. Ava's mommy issues are back. She abandons her life to go back to working, and the supporting cast of queer characters never fails to crack us up. All right, so we got to see that. In other news, 19 people got the Presidential Medal of Freedom. Among them were Nancy Pelosi, yay, Nancy, um, and Judy Shepard, who's Matthew Shepard's mom. Yep. But the interesting one that I dug a little deeper on was Jane Rigby. So who was Jane Rigby, Keith? He's going to know this, probably. She's a lesbian and civil servant astrophysicist at the NASA Goddard Space Flight Center, as well as the senior project scientist at the James Webb Space Teleco Telescope, which is the most powerful telescope in the world. She said in an interview, it's been much harder to be a queer person in science than a woman in science. Isn't that interesting? I would have thought the, the gender would, would get in the way first. She gave a series of interviews recently. She said her experience has been that she's absolutely a better astronomer because she's queer. It broadens her perspective, particularly yep. when it comes to community impact research. So if you're pursuing astronomy, her advice is do fabulous science, be fabulous, and be proud. OK, the gayest states. The number one, I, the number one. I think one, we're three. Oh my gosh. You, yeah. you, you have a lot of time on your hands to research no, these things. Okay. The we, number we've one We've reported state, on this. Number one, Oregon. Two, Delaware. That was surprising to me. It must be like per, you know, there's only three people that live there. One's per gay. capita. <laughs> per capita. No, it's a percentage. And Vermont is third with 7.4% of the population. And fourth is New Hampshire. Yeah. Interesting. Um, so you asked a lot of trivia. I found this in the, I think, The Advocate online. Who was the first out LGBTQ plus White House press secretary? It's our current yeah. secretary, uh, Karine Jean-Pierre. She's coming up on her second anniversary. The first black woman, first LGBT person uh, to hold that position. 
And she spent the weekend with eight drag queens she at did. a Washington, D.C. bar. I saw that at a bar. <laughs> I know, I saw that too. She said, it's not lost on me what my presence at the podium behind that lectern means. I'm an immigrant, I'm a queer black woman, I'm a person of color, and it's an incredib incredibly heavy weight that I carry. So, do I have, I have a couple more minutes? Yeah. Um, this is exciting. Charlotte, North Carolina had the United Methodists. They finally, as they were concluding their conference, removed the last barriers to full equality of LGBTQ plus members in the life of the church, repealing a 52-year-old declaration mm -hmm that the practice of homosexuality is incompatible with Christian teaching. They eliminated a passage on, uh, for condemning, uh, celebrating homosexual unions uh, and uh, the whole uh, being faithful in a heterosexual marriage bullshit. Oh, can I say that? They supported adding a requirement of integrity in personal relationships. I'm okay with that. I'm all right with that. Because that um, standard will hold to all Marriages, yes, not just that. exactly, and and it allows for ordination, mm -hmm. which had been prohibited before. And what was unique about that vote? It was by consent decree, which means it was a unanimous That's vote amazing. without controversy. That's cool. One one more quick thing, and then I'll I'll kick it back to you. Uh, I call this regrets. I've had a few because that was the name. <laughs> Did you know, this, this was interesting, people are significantly more likely to regret plastic surgery, tattoos, having children, than they are gender-affirming sur surgery. Less than 1%. You know, that's people, that's like a myth, that's a stereotype, right? Exactly. Oh, what if you change your mind? <clears throat> no. <Does>, yeah. <clears throat> it was a new report that said that, no, that, people got that wrong. All right, All right back to you. So, May is Asian American Pacific Islander Heritage Month. So this is this month's first trivia question. This was the first LGBTQ plus Asian American elected to the US Congress. And they were, there's bonus points if you know the year they were elected and the district they represent. And, and I could throw in, are they still serving? So looking at events, Rainbow Umbrella, the women's discussion group, book discussion group are still ongoing. Check out the Facebook pages if you're interested. The women's discussion group has fascinating notes about the conversation that's happening. And these are real in-depth conversations. These are not just your light entertainment kind of thing. Mosaic and Barry sexual violence program. On May 18th, on the State House lawn, from 2 to 4 p.m., tie-dye your pride event. Well, they will have banners and dye and come and make something creative. Also put on your calendar, Thursday, June 6th, 5 to 7 p.m., their open house. And it's at 140 Washington Street in Barrie. And as we had previously reported, they lost their office building, apartment, and shelter due to the flood. Mm -hmm. They could not afford to rehab the building. Ugh. So they have a totally new location. So, And we're going to be reporting on, in the future, they have two seminars coming up for our youth over the summer. And it's Let's Talk Sex. Mm -hmm. And it's several days consecutive. And it's an in-depth conversation about awareness, intimacy, negotiating, all of that. And Makes it sense. looks fascinating. So on Wednesday, June 19th, 6.30 p.m. at the Waterbury Congregational Church, we've been reporting on this, the mob and Stonewall oh, right. unraveling the mafia's influence in the 1969 uprising and on the next interview show, I will be interviewing Alex Hortis, mm. who is the person who is going to be presenting. Nice. And their promo says, Alex will delve into the intricate web of relationships, revealing how the mafia unintentionally pay, played a part in sparking the historic Stonewall uprising 
and it's a surprising twist that I hadn't heard before. Mm. So, and the evening is going to be started by live music from the Champlain Shoregasm. Mm. Be there. I will be there. Montpelier Pride, this is a 12-day event. Wow. Starting on May 29th with a drag show at Charlie O's, 8 p.m., and they say tip your performers. It's a cash bar, mm. but the performers are only going to give money if you know, you're, you're giving them a little something. On Thursday, May 30th, Queer Musicians Showcase at Three Penny Tap Room. Ooh. And that's 7.30 to 9.30. And then on Friday is, is the big event, which is the State House Festival and Parade. And that starts at 4 p.m. And it's followed by a dance at 8 p.m. at Rivers Way Movement Studio, which is 114 River Street. And there is a cover charge for that, but you can go on the site. I went there and once get they had pole dancing classes. I did not participate. I, I wasn't I was gonna I wasn't gonna look for a disclaimer, but I was meeting I, I was meeting a friend. How often have we heard that? <laughs> on on Sunday, June second, on your calendar again, yes. queer film festival at the Savoy, and Ooh. it's all day, and it's La Vie en Rose. Oh, but I'm a cheerleader, and there's a dress up oh. party to go with that. Little Richard, I am everything. Mm -hmm. So okay. it should be interesting. On Wednesday, June fifth, Tilly Walden, six p.m. at the Kellogg Harvard Library, and I'm going to be doing. A story on her on our next show. She is doing a graphic novel about a lesbian couple from here in Vermont mm. from the late 1800s. Ooh. And she got a humanities grant to do cool. it. Cool. Uh, Friday, this, June 7th, Queer Erotic Poetry at Fox Market. Then on Saturday, the 8th, is the Berry Pride Fest. Mm -hmm. And on June 9th is a political teach-in and networking starting at noon at the old labor hall. Mm. And there's you know, a breakdown of if you want to run for office, legislative advocacy. Oh, that's cool. A variety of issues. And there are going to be affinity breakout groups mm. where you can specifically talk with other people who have your interest. Oh, well, that's cool. But talking about Pride Days, Woodstock, Saturday, June 1st, their Pride Festival starts at 10 a.m. on with their high heel race <gasps> on Elm Street. What? Essex Pride is also on June 1st, starting at 11 a.m. at the park. This is their second year nice. of doing this. St. Albans is having a Pride Festival, which is a three-day event, June 7th through 9th. It's going to kick off with a drag show Friday night, all-day celebration Saturday with a parade leading into Taylor Park and a wrap-up Sunday with a family-oriented picnic and barbecue. Newport, Northeast Kingdom Pride. Oh, wow. Sunday, June 23rd, 12 to noon, they're planning a parade, live music, and Wait, more. Stay 12, tuned. He said 12 to noon. <laughs> oh, 12 to 4, excuse me. 12 noon to 4 p.m. Get there now, because it's ending. <laughs> there we go. Bennington is on June 30th with a parade and block party. Springfield Pride is on June 29th. Wow. 8 to 5. I'm exhausted. Now, there's a rumor that Bethel is going to also be doing oh, nice. their Pride <clears throat> on June 29th, but I haven't seen anything posted yet. And then on in July, and White River Junction mm. is having theirs, and it's a week long, July twentieth to twenty seventh. I haven't seen a listing of what they're doing, uh, but they've traditionally opted for a July events, so they're not competing with anybody else. Mm. Their whole emphasis this year, and their theme for their Pride Day is in response to the bomb threat last year when they did Drag Queen Story Hour. Mm, mm -hmm. So this is their, they're coming back bigger and stronger than ever. Mm -hmm. So with that. All right. <clears throat> well, best gay films of the year. And then <gasps> get out your popcorn. <sighs> Challengers, have you seen this? No. It's still in the theater. I don't know how it's gay, but I'm, now I'm intrigued. 
it's the story of uh, tennis. Uh, this woman who's got two men that are um, both interested in her. Oh, um, I've seen the promo, but it didn't. Yeah, I didn't know that there was I a gay angle. A Maybe the guys sleep with each other trying to get to her. I don't know. Maybe all three of them do. Maybe they do. Um, okay. Love Lies Bleeding. Yeah. My daughter told me I had to see this. I yeah. haven't seen this yet. Um, it says it's sexy, dirty, gory, um, and brutal, and problematic as hell. Sign me up. Linda, you uh, and me a matinee. <laughs> nonstop amazing. With a climax that's impossible to forget. It shows problematic lesbians. <laughs> Those are a dime a dozen. <laughs> Moving on. <laughs> like, <laughs> Keith's being good. I'm we not. Will we will name uh, no the names. The People's Joker, a reimagined if the Joker from uh, the comics, DC Comics, was transgender. Ooh. Yeah. Interesting. It says hilarious, original, touching, and wild. Problemista. Uh, let's see, a dream-filled toy designer who immigrated to America from El Salvador pairs up with an, uh, an art critic who wants to put on a show. Hmm. Mean Girls, uh. also didn't know that had a gay angle. Stress Positions, in the early months, takes place in the early months of the pandemic. Uh, uh, stars John Early as a super stressed gay man who takes in his mysterious male model nephew to help him heal from a broken leg. First, I'm not going there. You can't uh, make me. <laughs> I, uh, and then I saw the TV glow, a haunting oh, yeah. atmospheric trans metaphor wrapped in a del devilishly, I can't talk today, haunting teen horror film. It follows two teen best friends who are obsessed with a Buffy style show. Yeah. And as they grow up, the line between reality and fiction blurs, and they aren't sure if it really was just a show. Ooh. Ooh. All right. Um, sexual diversity in the afterlife. Yeah. Did you hear about this? Yeah. Jesus was asexual? Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> Jesus believed there is no male, neither male nor female. Everyone will be like the angels in heaven, asexual, non-binary being, beings who do not have romantic or sexual partnerships. The U.S. Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, did you hear about this? I was at a conference hot off the presses, uh, came out with some more language around protections for transgender yes. workers per using preferred pronouns, that that is workplace harassment, uh, barring people from using bathrooms uh, of their choice, of their gender identity. They came up with more uh, enforcement guidance. Uh, they is also this, gave some... I was going to say, is that the one that there's already a group of Republican states that are... Are fighting it. Yeah, mm -hmm. that are filing a, yeah. a, a suit. They also put in some language around not discriminating against employees based on decisions to yeah. have abortions or use contraception. Yeah. Uh, Daniel Radcliffe mm -hmm. uh, has responded to J.K. Rowling's uh, oh. wanting an apology for his advocacy on behalf of trans youth. And he said that uh, basically, <laughs> pound sand, um, he's, he's long been outspoken as an advocate for the rights of trans youth, even as Rowling has become one of the UK's most infamous TERFs. Yeah. Trans exclusionary radical feminist. Yeah. What a, that's quite a term. And she's directly called him out. He, uh, she responded to a fan who said they were waiting on a public apology from his co-star, he and his co-star, Emma Watson. Uh, he told The Atlantic, I will continue to support the rights of all LGBTQ plus people, and I have no further comment. He did say that he was, um, makes me really sad uh, because I look at the person that I met. Can you imagine meeting somebody when you're like 10 or 12 that you admire that wrote this? amazing story. The person that I met, the times that we met, the books that she wrote, and that world that she created, and all of that that to me is so de deeply mm -hmm. empathic for her to have that stance. You know, So I thought that was interesting. Um, a new report from the National LGBTQ Plus Women's Community Survey was published. Uh, there was there's a lot of statistics in here, but there were <clears throat> a lot of information about, uh, particularly they had a whole thing on lesbians, which won't surprise any of us listening to this, but uh, that 
LGBTQ plus women face a tremendous amount of abuse, but they rely on friends to help them weather the storm. 65% of the people responding to the survey experienced verbal harassment, 51% were bullied, 32% faced sexual harassment, 16% have been sexually assaulted. Um, <clears throat> but, but the data supports what we know to be true, that found family and community yeah. makes a huge difference. Education doesn't equate to higher salaries. I could have told you that. <laughs> that uh, LGBTQ plus women are more educated than the rest of the population. 50% working full time with a graduate or professional degree and yet make less money, significantly yeah. earn less, significantly less money. And of course, gender fluid, uh, pansexual and trans identify people have it the worst. Political policies, 30 Two percent said health care and reproductive rights are their top priority. Nine out of ten people surveyed voted in the 2020 election. Yes, that's 96 percent Democrat. That doesn't shock anyone, does it? Uh, main drivers between violence and LGBT that LGBT women face. Those surveyed reported uh, sexism, 38 percent, racism, 34 yeah. percent. Uh, hate crimes, 26%, and body weight, 18%. Here's something for Ann and Linda. Pay attention. Lesbian sex is better, according to the survey. <laughs> <laughs> LGBTQ plus women are having more sex and more often, 84% of the time, versus the general population at 73%, and are having more fun. I will save you some of the juicy language here. Um, the HBO reality series, We're Here. Have you seen this? I just stumbled across it when I was in a hotel. It's on HBO. I don't right. get HBO. I don't get HBO. Um, it's pretty. Uh, so it's folks from RuPaul's Drag Race right. in small town America in Tennessee somewhere. And it's just you know palpable watching these folks walk the streets. Whew. Boy Scouts of America announced Tuesday that it will change its name to yep. Scouting yep. America next year as a way to be more inclusive. The youth organization and the new name is meant to help everyone, including boys and girls, I mean, I would hope, feel more welcome. The change will go into effect February 8th, 2025 on the organization's 115th anniversary. We have another milestone, uh, and 12 years ago, on May 9th, Barack Obama made a historic declaration on national television supporting same-sex marriage, a momentous event that would significantly shape the landscape of LGBTQ rights in America. And did you hear the news? We're getting a red, white, and royal blue sequel. Did you watch this? No. Did you read it? No. Oh my gosh, Keith. Well, you're busy studying politics or something. Yeah, there you are. We read it in our book club. It's uh, two gay young men. Well, one is bi, one is gay. One is the president's uh, son here in the US, and the other one is, yes, is I, in, yeah. the prime minister. OK. Yeah. Well, they're making a sequel. And they're both very attractive young men, so you should check it out. Uh, the boys are back at, <laughs> as both stars have agreed to return, along with the writer of the original book. OK, and Mother's Day, <clears throat> we just had. Uh, and in a personal essay, author Shannon Manon talks about how loving her transgender son has transformed her. And our love for our transgender children compels us to live in tension between reality and possibility, between a broken world and a new world calling. And all the while, we're cultivating the qualities to endure these perilous times and shape them. I thought that was a cool Mother's Day tribute That's to nice. Mother's Giving to their. And finally, this is just for a cheap laugh. It's not really related to okay. about Trump. <laughs> OK, you don't need to say any more. Right. Well, did you hear he got his son's age wrong? Like, how do you not, speaking of Mother's Day, how do you not know your children's age? OK, anyway, in an interview on Telemundo, Trump called himself <laughs> ambidextrous. <laughs> but that's not what he meant, Keith. <laughs> when he obviously had no clue what the word meant, if you can believe it. Trump's 
flub came while he was bragging about himself after being asked how he's able to focus on both his campaign and his legal woes, the GOP presidential frontrunner said that he can put it all aside because he called himself very ambidextrous, so to speak. I have no comment, <laughs> but mo moving to Vermont where hopefully life is a little more, yeah. In case you haven't heard, mm. Mike Pichek. Yeah. He's running for re-election. Nice. And there was a phenomenal kickoff. We got to march with Capitol him in the parade, Park. remember? He, yeah. he may be mar he will be marching nice. with us again. Nice. So, <clears throat> and lo looking at the legislative session that just ended and some of the bills that we have been reporting on, S220, and this was the bill about public libraries, mm -hmm. establishing procedures for reviewing potential objections to their books and other materials. This was, or that the library would have to disclose what your kid took out. No, no, no. We put in positive language. This is passed. So Vermont is going to have protections in place that even if you object to a book, it doesn't mean it's coming out of my library. That, mm. you know, we have our own standards and ethics. You, you check out the book you want. Do there I get a go. brown paper wrapper if it's something wildly inappropriate? <clears throat> if you would like. <laughs> S-278, comparative negligence, and this is a bill that we debated back and forth when it got introduced. Did you know that if you win a, a sexual violence case, that the person you, or, or harassment or whatever, that they can counter sue you in a civil suit and said, well, you had some of the blame what? And they could reduce the settlement what? that you got by whatever is the percentage that the court says, you know. And this was a young man who was sexually assaulted at a athletic club event. Ugh. And they tried to allege that he had been at a prior event where there was a fight. So he should have known that violence could occur. He appealed it to the state Supreme Court and won. And he was the person advocating this is not only past repealing totally mm. the comparative negligence, <clears throat> but it's been signed into law already. And it was by unanimous vote in both chambers. Nice. So very good. Whew. S-289, and this was a bill that I had great hopes for, and it would establish that in any advertising that was directed at our youth, that the best interest of our youth needed to be taken into account. And it was still being debated on the last day. Mm. People were doing amendments. It does not look as though it passed. <clears throat> H483, this is the bill that I had real hopes for, setting up a protocol whereby all of those independent schools oh, right. could get state one. tuition dollars mm. and this would have put into place that they had to comply with the state's non-discrimination statutes, mm -hmm. didn't even get out of Ugh. the Senate Education Committee, which has been a long problem. Aren't they uh, currently getting funded through some loophole and they get to no. have crazy well, no, there, doctor, there They don't have a, to comply right now, right? Well, no, no, no. There's a US, there was a U.S. court decision that if you are opening it up for tuition, everyone gets to play. Yeah everyone gets to be considered. Yeah. There were several schools that are currently suing. Mm. Uh, Mid-Christian Academy is the one that comes to mind saying, we want the federal dollars, uh, we want the state tax dollars, we will take tuition students, but we want to be able to choose which students we accept. Right. And we want to follow our own Christian doctrine, not the state non-discrimination. Right. So they are suing to be able to do that. Mm. But a decision hasn't been made yet. Mm. And my guess is that will make it to the US Supreme Court as well. Um, S206, Juneteenth is now a legal holiday in Vermont as soon as it was passed. Nice. So there we go. That's great. 
H-72, and this was the bill introduced by Taylor Small that would establish the safe injection sites. Mm. And it's passed both the House, nice. it passed the Senate, but there has already been statements that it is going to be vetoed. Do they have How, the votes to overturn they've got it? The, they've got the votes to override, and they've already scheduled a veto session for June. Nice. The other that passed is it will be another constitutional amendment and it's a declaration of rights and this will include sexual orientation, gender identity, and gender expression as a protected class in our constitution. Ooh, nice. Very good. The other is S-114. They are establishing a psychedelic therapy advisory work group. They were posed to make the use of psychedelics for a therapeutic reason legal in the state of Vermont. Think Michael Palin and his trip to Australia and going through the sessions where they used LSD and his coming out saying, I didn't realize how much it would open me up, the awareness I would gain from this, hmm. and the benefit to me from having experienced this. <laughs> so <laughs> we may be the first state. Wow. So, <laughs> so looking at Maine that we have been reporting on off and on for a while, our dear friend Ryan Fecto, who was their former Speaker of the House, openly LGBTQ+. He was the youngest Speaker of the House in the U.S. Mm. He was the first LGBTQ+. Maine has term limits. He was from Biddeford. There were already people who represented his district. They've chosen not to run again, so Ryan's probably going back to the State House. Yay. So I'm, I'm looking forward to it. The other bills that we had reported on relative to Maine, one was they had originally introduced a bill that would make Maine a shield law state the same as Vermont is. You come here for abortion or gender affirmation services, we are not going to cooperate with your state of origin if they're looking at... Um, bringing charges against you, or you've come here because it is something that is not available in your state, mm -hmm. we're not going to play with them. That's passed, nice, and it's signed into law. They had reintroduced it, better language, mm. and it's happened. Nice. Um, the other thing that Maine did that I'm hoping Vermont's going to do is they've redone their statutes relative to restoration with their indigenous communities. Mm. These, this is the harm we've done to you. We need to undo it. And there needs to be a restorative process in place that is deliberate and for which the indigenous communities are actively involved and it's their guidance. So mm. they've done that. New Hampshire. Now, we had some concerns about New Hampshire. Well, they had two oh, there's bills. Oh, more, there's more to that? Oh, God. <laughs> well, well um, Littleton, they did po positive things happen. The conservative senator who was also on their city council that brought was trying to defund the arts council because they did Lakasha Fole and oh, they had oh, inclusive. Yeah. Mm -hmm. She got defeated by the co chair of the Pride Committee. Yes. So, but they, they had several bills going through their Honesty in Education Act, and one would have required s school officials to disclose to parents if a student came up and made made statements relative to gender identity, sexual orientation, whatever. And it was, you know, you come and tell me and I immediately have to notify your parents of what you told me. And the other was a ban on transgender 
women participating in sports, both on the high school and collegiate level. Both of them were tabled indefinitely in committee. So nothing is yes. going to happen with them, which was very encouraging. And we're going to have time here. Yeah. So think about what you'd like to talk about. <laughs> Sir, uh, <clears throat> Saranac Lake, New York, did you hear about this? Mm -mm. Kelly Metzgar, and she's the director of the Adirondack North Country Gender Alliance. Over the past year, year and a half, her inclusive flags have been repeatedly torn off her house and thrown into the bushes. Kelly is a transgender woman and is a very focused, deliberate attack. However, the police have been there saying, OK, what can we do? How can we respond to this? This is not who we are. They lent her cameras. Oh, I was going to ask that. They, they're trail cameras. <clears throat> until she could get her own. And they have worked, the police have worked with the Alliance saying, what can we do for public education? What can we do to reach out to the community to say, wait a minute, you know, there's something happening here. There's either a misperception of who we are, what we're all about, how can we undo that? So the police and the Alliance are working together to do public forums to undo the hate that's been created. However, both the police and Kelly believe this is somebody who is watching Kelly closely because the most recent incident happened the night when she took the cameras down to recharge them. So there was no tape to look. That's creepy, though, that, that's very, that they have that well, level of... But <clears throat> her, her statement is, you know, she, she, is, she says she feels safe and supported in the Adirondacks. More than 90 community members, businesses, organizations signed a letter to the editor in support of her. She says she's most worried about what is this impact on our youth. And this was her closing comment. I don't feel scared, I don't feel threatened, and I'm not leaving. Mm. Apparently, she's lived in this community for over 40 years. So. Wow. <sighs> so any hot issues you'd like to talk about? We've, <laughs> we, we've got almost 15 minutes. You see that, Ann? <laughs> <laughs> what? what? Uh, are you going to get, well, give us the trivia answer while, oh. while, while, I, while I vamp a while little. You, while you yeah. ponder this? While I ponder this, yes, exactly. So, and, and Ann and Linda should have known this because this was the answer last year and when we entered oh. Asian American Pacific Islander. Okay. Because we don't have a lot of history that we've documented and shared. It's like when you start talking about indigenous people's history, you have to really search for it. It's not something that we've really folded into mm -hmm. you know, our, our educational process, the history that we're taught. But it was in 1994. It is Mark Takano who represents the 41st Congres Congressional District in California, which is the Riverside area. So, but sort of building off that, you know, it's not something that's folded into our educational system. Um, I believe it's Rhode, Rhode Island this month also became a shield state. But there is a state that's looking at ensuring that LGBTQ plus curriculum is part of the public school curriculum. Hmm. And it's one of the things that I was kind of, I was really disappointed with our legislature during the session. They again did not address the issue of harassment and bullying hmm. in our schools. There was language that had been given to both the Senate Education Committee, House Education Committee, House 
general committee that would change that standard so that it was based not on a severe and pervasive standard, which is almost impossible to meet because of the documentation, intent, et cetera, to an impact statement. This is the effect that the actions had on you, mm. not throwing it onto what was the intent of the person who was doing the action. Because that's what we really want to look at for our youth. You know, if I'm yelling pejoratives at you on a daily basis, yeah, you want to deal with me and my conduct, but you also should be focusing on what is the impact on the student to whom that is directed. And that should be the guiding influence. And also there should be a uniform standard statewide so that if you're the student who is enduring this harassment, you know the actions that can and will be taken. There is a defined timeline when you will be notified of action and that there will be an appeal process if you disagree with the actions taken by the educational institution. And my perspective has been that this should be given to the Human Rights Commission. It should not be an in necessarily an internal school investigation. I'm going to investigate myself. I have some issues with that. But. Yeah. <clears throat> so I was just thinking as you were saying that, that going back to the EEOC, they're well positioned to be much more involved in those kinds of things. And yeah. it's like the uh, fox minding the hen house, right? So this exactly. new change in the law, I think, is really going to be great because it puts some real teeth into people making, you know, those slights, those little things, those little kind of, you know, a thousand yeah. death, death by a thousand cuts, people that are being harassed and intentionally misgendered. And, you know, yeah. it's one thing to inadvertently get the pronoun wrong, but when you do that deliberately and repeatedly, the cumulative impact of that harassing behavior is, is, um, is devastating to folks. And one of the things I've been working on for years is that there's the law, yeah. right, and protected classes, and then there's people that are just incivil, uncivil, is that a word, uncivil? So there's a whole piece of this law through the EEOC that's it's called on civility. Like, how do we, <laughs> how do we behave better, and how do you put that into law? You know. So when when does somebody cross the line? So I've been creating these policies, respectful workplace policies, that whether you're in a protected class or not, our culture won't tolerate these behaviors. And to your point, here are the behaviors. Yep. Here's what we want to see. Here's what we don't want to see. Here's what we're going to do if we see it. Here's the process. Here are your rights. Here's where, you, here's where you're going to go to file a complaint. Here's what we are going to do about it as your employer. And here's what you can do if you're not satisfied with all of that. That's, that's what Title VII is all about. We need to take that piece of legislation, sort of superimpose it over some of these new categories of protected classes and bring those to the schools and hold them accountable. And it, you're going in the, in the direction that, that I was talking about, which is you not only need to look at these are the behaviors or these are the overt behaviors, but this is the impact right. of those behaviors and it's the impact of the behaviors that drives the process, mm -hmm. not necessarily being driven by the behaviors themselves. Because, because what usually happens in those instances is if I have aggrieved you, I have to write this little thing out that says, oh, I'm, I'm so sorry for what I do, did, and here's what I hand to you, mm -hmm. and then I may have to go for some type of class training, whatever, about, oh, these are the bad things about your, your behaviors or the impact of it. But what about you? Right. I, you just got this piece of paper. Did, did that help? No. Did that do anything? <laughs> no. And what did it take? for whoever it was to say, oh, something needs to happen here. Mm -hmm. I mean, right. so conversations, with, conversations with our youth, they would talk about 
you know, being harassed on a fairly consistent basis, same individuals, and there would be school officials, and you know, either staff, <clears throat> faculty, whatever, who witnessed it happen happening and took no action. Right. So, so there's right vicarious liability, a yep. piece of the law that says you should be held personally liable and responsible if you don't take action. My worry for the kids is retaliation. You yeah. get those kids that are bullies. Not only are the educators not taking it seriously, but now you've set that kid up to, for future harassment potentially. And then you have uh, vicarious trauma, people that are overhearing this and don't have the courage or the ego strength to stand up to those people that are you know, perpetrating the behavior. So it becomes this much wider circle of who's impacted than just the person having that experience. And so one of the things I always recommended when I was investigating these types of situations was asking the, in sort of in air quotes, the victim what would feel supportive to them. And that's yeah. the piece that the legislation always seems to miss. Exactly. It's like, Keith, you're bad and we're gonna slap your wrist and you're gonna have to send an apology and don't do it again. But meanwhile, the person that's been impacted by that carries that with them and they need support to figure out you know, it, how to feel better about the situation or move on. And we haven't even talked about the impact of social networks on all of this. You know, all of the, the social medias that our youth are so adept at mm -hmm. and know how to get around all the... Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. All right, well, thank you for coming and spending this Thanks time. Thanks for having me here. I would say one more thing. We, our book club is reading a book called After Sappho, which is, um, I thought it was going to be essays, but it's a, a series of short vignettes uh, imagining talking to some feminists and queer folk over the years. So uh, Josephine Baker, I think, is one, Virginia Woolf, and a bunch of folks that have informed uh, queer literature over the last 150 years or so. And uh, so our, cl our book club, um, you can find out more on Momentum. Linda and Ann post on that and tell people what the book is, where to get the book, how to get the book. But I'm intrigued. Uh, so I'm looking forward to, to digging more and learning more about that. So. All right. And so thanks for letting me crash. And exactly. And on a future show, we'll talk about what's happened to Momentum and mm. what's going on at the Pride Center. There, yeah. there may be a and conversation. Do, so. do I need to take five minutes and bum people out, Keith? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> Should we get but, out? But as Linda always says, remember always... always. Resist. Resist.